I'm Nazanin Boniadi. Um, some of you may know me as an actor. I was born in Iran right after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. My parents were opposed to the newly formed Islamic Republic regime. And when I was 20 days old, they had to escape. My father was on an execution list and we fled to London. When I went to Iran for the first time at the age of 12, and I'll never forget, I was walking down the street with my uncle and the so-called morality police came up to me and my uncle and in a very harsh tone demanded that we show prove that we're married because we were simply walking down the street. And it was such a jarring, harrowing experience that it was seared into my mind. And I remember thinking in that moment that if I ever have a platform where I could tell people what the experience, the everyday experience of young girls in Iran is, I would, would share that. And here we are now in this moment, and I've been fighting for 14 years to amplify the voices of the Iranian people against their oppressive regime. What people may not know is that before the revolution, the Islamic revolution of 1979, women could choose how they could dress. In fact, you had peaceful coexistence of women who chose to cover and veil, and women like my mother who wore mini skirts to work and, and high heels and lipstick and, um, and no hijab. And women could become judges. They could assume the highest ministerial roles in the country. They were very much a part of the fabric of society. All of that was taken away. Since the revolution, women are segregated from men in the workplace, in the classroom, at beaches. They have to sit at the back of the bus. Women can't sing solo in public. They can't ride a bicycle. They can't attend a sporting event at an arena. The most basic rights were taken away from them. So while we're seeing these protests unfold and it's a fight against compulsory hijab, that is a symbol. It's just a symbol of a, a greater oppression. The thing that sparked these current protests was the murder of 22-year-old Massa Amini because of inappropriate hijab. This is a fight that has existed for 43 years. In fact, when the compulsory hijab was first put into law, women in their tens of thousands took to the street to oppose it. So if they started to cover, it wasn't because they chose to cover, it was because they were forced and subjugated. Recently, there was the case of competitive climber El Nazrakabi. You could see her climbing in, in South Korea in a competition without the hijab. Now, this is unprecedented because every woman who competes on behalf of the Islamic Republic has to wear the compulsory hijab. She didn't. We were very concerned for her when her, apparently her family, her friends didn't hear from her for 24 hours. And then next thing you know, she lands in Tehran to a hero's welcome. Hundreds of people showed up at 4 a.m. when she landed and they were chanting Ahraman, which means hero, heroine. And yet she was forced to say that this was an accident and she didn't mean to not wear the hijab. But knowing what happens inside Iran, knowing that, that forced confessions and torture exist and the intimidation tactics that they used to silence people, we are very concerned for her, for her, and, and we just hope that she's not under too much duress. I recently met with um, Vice President Kamala Harris, and you know, I communicated what the people in Iran are saying. The thing that sets these protests apart is that that protesters are fighting back against the security forces. You're seeing women not only taking off their hijabs, but they are burning their hijabs. You're seeing young girls, students and, and high school students taking to the streets and joining the protests. This could be the first female revolution of our time. This is a global moment. The main thing that I communicated to the administration was the Iranian people have voiced what they want. They want to enter theocracy. Standing by the Iranian people does not mean having a policy of regime change. It means empowering people who want freedom. And how do we do that? We make sure that they have internet access. We make sure that they can communicate with the outside world and can organize so that they can determine the future of their country.
the international community has to stand by the Iranian people. And the most basic thing we can do is calling for an urgent session at the UN Human Rights Council, ensuring that we have accountability mechanisms in place so that these things don't keep happening. I'm not asking for intervention, I'm asking for empowerment of freedom-loving Iranians. I've been doing this for 14 years and this is the first time I've seen this kind of global solidarity. I think it struck a chord in people in a similar way that the anti-apartheid movement did in the 80s. The same type of impassioned speech that then Senator Joe Biden gave at the Senate. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. And the South Africans are majority black and they are being excoriated. That's exactly what we want. We want that rhetoric, we want the follow-up action of just amplifying the Iranian people allowing their voices to be heard. It strikes a chord with anybody who's ever supported civil and human rights in the States, bodily autonomy, um, Black Lives Matter. I mean, it truly resonates across so many movements. It's been five weeks of protests and people said it would be done in two and they're still going. But you're seeing people unite in a way that they've never united inside Iran, across ethnicities, across it's men and women, which I think is striking into the heart of a regime that has built itself on segregating men and women in Iran. And so many more people outside of Iran are waking up to that fact. And there's only one way to do it. We have to stand by them and ensure that this time they win.